Well, first off, let me thank all of you that took to Twitter and submitted your questions for the weekly q and I really appreciate it. For those of you that want your questions answered in future Q&As, and you watch these Q&A videos, but you say, hey, I got questions, like you can go to Twitter, follow the show, at OTR Central is the Twitter handle, and that's where you can ask your questions. Um, and then you should subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. So, because of the number of questions, I'm going to split this up into two parts. So this will be uploaded sometime late Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning, and then part two of the weekly Q&A will be sometime probably Wednesday afternoon or evening. So let's go ahead and get started here. Splash Bro Kieran's going to kick us off this time. If you got the chance to ask John Cena one question, why would it be about his love of kissing babies and hugging fat girls? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> or apparently his imperialistic colonialist uh, gimmick that he has now. Who the fuck knew that he spoke Mandarin? <laughs> Jesus, John Cena bowing down and sucking off China so bad, motherfucker could be in the NBA doing that shit. Uh, yeah, but that would be the one question. You know, what what is the appeal of kissing babies and hugging fat girls for you? Like, why does that make you uh, giddy? Yeah, I, would, I think that's absolutely the appropriate question to ask. Uh, at Dalek of Chaos asks, what would your dream match for China have been? Uh, maybe Victoria, Beth Phoenix, or Awesome Kong? Um, that's a good question. Out of those three that you listed, I'd probably go with Beth Phoenix. There'd be the most similarity there. Like, I think that would be the one that I would go with. At MC17 Clark. With the rumors about Bray Wyatt being away due to mental health issues regarding Brody Lee's death, do you think WWE should offer grief counseling to the wrestlers when they suffer a loss? And should Benoit have gotten grief counseling when Eddie passed away? You know, as far as the Benoit piece, maybe. But boy, that's awful revisionist history to assume that that was going to make any fucking difference whatsoever. And I, I want to be absolutely clear here, too. Like, there, there is both the importance of like understanding that mental health can be a challenge for millions of folks. I, I would make the argument that every single person on the planet has some type of mental issue of one kind or another. The person that denies that they have one is the person that probably has the biggest one of all. Um, you know, like probably your friend, it's your boy, it's your brother in arms, but at some point in time, like you got to move the fuck on with your life too. And that might come across kind of crass and harsh, but you know, that's fucking reality. And I'm sorry, but like, yeah, it sucks that Brody Lee passed away. It absolutely sucks that Jonathan Huber died at such a young age. And I'm sure that impacted, you know, Bray Wyatt and many others that were close to him, many other friends that he had. But at some point in time, you got to do right by Jonathan Huber's memory and get to fucking work and find a way to deal with it. And... You know, like, like I said, probably coming across a little crass and harsh. And so the reality is that the world is a very crass and har harsh place. Um, so, yeah, should they offer grief counseling if they don't? Sure. Yeah, and that, that could be a helpful step in the process. But you know, at some point in time, that can only help but so much. If people have deeper seated issues, that grief counseling alone is not going to make much of a difference. Uh, Kill Inc. underscore Mukahid. What is your favorite match and character from the Ruthless Aggression era? Um, <laughs> my favorite, like, character character was the original version of rapping John Cena. There's no question in my mind. Like, in terms of, you know, I could say somebody like Taker or something like that, but that's kind of easy. But the one you wouldn't expect me to say, like, I loved heel, aggressive, rapping-ass John Cena. Like, that run in 2003... Fan fucking tastic, fantastic. Um, at Center five one one ninety. Of all the things that has made wrestling not as great as before, the predict protection of finishing moves is certainly one of them. Which is the move that has become a basic one that, in your view, was an awesome finish? For me, it's the DDT. That's a great one. The super kick is certainly another one. Um, the one that pisses me off the most, though, is probably the pile driver. Like, to me, 
if you're a wrestler, and I don't care how many moves you fucking do, like, who gives a shit? If you use a pile driver as a setup move or as a pile driver as just part of your chain wrestling, in my opinion, you fucking suck. That should be a, you got dropped on your fucking head, this shit is over. And only once in a blue moon does anybody kick out of that crap. I totally agree with you. One of the big problems is we don't protect the damn finishers. And you have moves like the fucking pile driver of all damn things that even in and of itself isn't done all the time. So when it is, it should be special. It shouldn't be something you use in your comeback or as part of your chain fucking wrestling. At Metalhead674, old friend of the show, Mean Matt Messerkamp. What would have been a better WrestleMania main event? Uh, Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair, or John Cena versus Randy Orton. John Cena versus Randy Orton, WrestleMania 38, because man, you've got all that freaking ego and history and everything else. You know, they got people that are going to deny it and say, I don't want to see that shit. Oh, they do. They absolutely do. Uh, but Hogan and Flair at WrestleMania 8 probably would have been the thing. That probably would have been the thing. Uh, let's see here. Who's next? At the Big D, 9817-8301. Short your goddamn Twitter handle. Mickey James was recently fired and told women do not draw money. In your eyes, Jeff, do, does women's wrestling draw money? Um, I would certainly say this, that women can move the needle from a viewership standpoint. Women certainly can move the needle in terms of drawing in new eyeballs. So in that sense, in that sense alone, not even talking about other factors, like you look at some of the women now throughout the different companies like WWE, AEW, you know, some of the highest rated segments, the highest rated matches belong to women. So yeah, they can absolutely draw money. And I think you go back to that Monday Night Wars attitude area period and you talk about some of the women that were massive national, international stars, like women absolutely can draw money in wrestling. And if anybody told Mickey James that they don't and they were somebody in WWE, they should be immediately f be fired. Because then I would question, why would you prioritize the women so much in your goddamn company if they didn't draw money? And if your thing is, well, equality, equality is all fine and good, but at the end of the day, you're a business. And if the boys were drawing more money, then the boys are what you have to feature. If the women are drawing more money, then the women are who you'd primarily feature. So yeah, that's a dumb statement for somebody to say that women don't draw money at all. They absolutely do. Um, wrestling rants. Once WWE returns on the road and fans are able to get their fix of going to shows, will the product being so bad likely prevent them from taming full capacity once they're allowed to? Or will they get full sellouts for a while still once they can fill arenas? I think there will be a piece that initially there could be a bump like they will sell out shows just because people are looking to get back to normal. People are excited about being able to go to shows. For folks, it might have been a year and a half, two years since they've been able to go to a show. So there's going to be a period of time where folks are catching up. So it's probably going to lead to higher attendance in the short term, would be my thought. Long term, will that be sustainable? Probably not. But in the short term, I expect it to be a higher level of average attendance than what they would typically see. Um, at under underscore the Matt show. My favorite reviews on this channel are WrestleMania 25 and SummerSlam 2010. When you think about it, out of these two re reviews, uh, which show pisses you off the most? Um, WrestleMania 25 pissed me off because some fucking idiot thought that Taker versus Shawn Michaels shouldn't be the main event. That it should be God versus Orton. Breakfast Club rules, bitches. Um, but it's got to be SummerSlam 2010 because... WrestleMania 25 was a disappointing show, and the card placement was stupid and fireable offense. But SummerSlam 2010 literally derailed an entire group's push and killed basically everybody that was involved with it from the Nexus side of things. So that pisses me off full more. Um, at Playmaker underscore Ghetto, uh, what are your thoughts on WWE without a valid reason breaking up the Hurt business? Is honestly, when I was watching Raw, I thought that WWE should build their whole program around them and have them control Raw, withholding all possible major titles on Raw. See, that's what a sensible, logical person would have done, especially when you made the decision to have Bobby Lashley become the WWE champion. Like, that's what a sane, rational, logical person would do. 
Vince at this stage of his life is not a sane, rational, logical person. Therefore, he didn't do it. Of course it was dumb, of course it was fucking stupid. It is totally something in Vince's wheelhouse to do. Just because he got caught up in a whim and he wanted to change something. Like it's a hard business model to sit there and deal with somebody that is prone to these type of, I don't want to do this anymore type of things. Uh, at Nick Willis PNW, who has the biggest ego? Cody Rhodes, the Memphis Midcard piece of crap, the Schleg Daddy, or Michael Jordan? The Memphis Midcard piece of crap tried to start two different companies to make himself the showcase. That trumps all. That's the winner. At 94, Andre R. Bryant. What year do you consider wrestling's boom and what year do you consider to be wrestling's decline? I think you've seen a couple of that over the years. The 80s were certainly a boom period for wrestling as it expanded nationally and internationally and the whole model of the business changed. I think when you look at the mid-90s, specifically like 92-ish to 96, I guess it was really bad. Um, and obviously you have like later on into the 96 going into probably 2001, the beginning of 2001. That was another wrestling boom. Um, I think real decline happened around 2010 or so, and the business has never really truly recovered from that. I think we're in a wrestling decline now, frankly. Uh, at Mr. Underscore Ethical, what are your thoughts on Velvet Team Dream's recent response to his allegations? Feels like too little, too late. It feels like it is either one of two things. If you believe that he's guilty of what he was accused of, then he probably looks not believable and more guilty with his response. If you believe in like an innocent to, to proven guilty, or you believe that he was innocent of it, you didn't believe some of the other accusations, then I think it's a matter of like that statement in some ways seemed well thought out, logical in its response, told a believable story and maybe too believable. But as a result, you might look at that as like vindication and validation that he didn't do it. You know, I guess it just comes down to public opinion or your own personal opinion. I think I think the one thing I want to I want to point out here about this whole situation with Patrick Clark and the Velveteen Dream is there's one thing that really concerns me is that this kind of flash mob mentality of as soon as somebody's accused, we automatically go to cancel them, we shut them down, like we automatically believe the accusers. And I want to be clear here. When somebody is making an accusation like this, they should be heard, they should be listened to, they, they, they should be researched and investigated in terms of whether there is validity or merit to the allegations or not. Um, but we should not automatically believe them. Like this whole thing of like, hey, they made an allegation, so this is true and that other person should rot in hell. Uh, there are plenty of people that you could point at and say, their perspective on things might be one thing when the reality might be something different to many others. Then you also have those kind of sick, twisted folks that will sit there and make false allegations of harassment, of assault, of rape. Like these things happen. And we need to be logical enough, and I know that is damn near impossible in today's fucking world, but we need to be damn logical enough to be able to say, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm going to reserve some judgment until I find out more information. Like, it is okay to do that. And, and for some reason, that's become not a thing. Like, you have a lot of women and then some of the fucking men that want to sit there and suck up to them like they're going to get fucked by the women, which isn't going to happen anyways. You're like, oh, they cancel them, cancel them, cancel them. What if you're condemning an innocent man? I'm not saying he's innocent. I'm also not saying he's guilty. The fact of the matter remains, like, you're going to have an opinion on it maybe, but, like, seeing this play out the way that it did was really concerning to me. It's typical. It's what I would expect out of the society now. But allegations should be heard, listened, researched, investigated. They should not automatically be believed no matter fucking what. Because somewhere along the line in this country, we were still supposed to hold true to a fundamental premise of innocent until proven guilty. And it's these same folks, like I bring up before, like these same folks that are sit there and rage about him, but then they would cheer when in Austin. 
appears on a raw or something. So a literal like pleaded no contest to abuse, which basically makes him a, a documented proven wife beater. You'll celebrate. And I'm picking on him. He's clearly not the only one where you could talk about like this. Like the, the outrage that we have is very selective. Same, same folks that are talking about like Mike Tyson, you know, Mike Tyson is a convicted rapist. Whether you believe in the validity of those charges, like, like me, you know, it's questions like, I don't know about all that, but he's also well-documented, like, woman beater. So, y'all are and rage talking about Patrick Clark being a groomer and a pedophile and a predator and all this, and he may be, but he may not be. But then you'll celebrate these others, like, it just doesn't make any fucking sense to me. Like, so that's probably more than what you were asking for, Mr. Ethical, but that's the answer you're going to get. Like, I'm not surprised. And no, this is not a specifically or strictly wrestling-related thing. Like, this is just a internet social media thing. It's the world that we're in. It's the society that we're in. And no, you can't say it's just from one political ideology because the other political I ideology is the same fucking thing. Oh my God, we're going to sit there and go rage by a bunch of my pillows because we support that dipshit CEO. Oh, that type of dumb shit. Um, I'm just wondering why it took him so long to really address and answer them in the way that he did. Like that's now maybe he got advice from the WWE, um, to do that. And, and to me, I would just kind of question the judgment there of why, why would you have waited so long? Like if he, if he got that advice, it was really, really bad advice. Because when you bother putting this out basically a year later, like it'll make people question and wonder. And it makes me question and wonder a little bit too, frankly. So that's what I got to say about that. Um, we got time for a couple more questions, I think, in this video before I cut it off and record part two. Uh, at Electric Requiem, what is the absolute dog shit worst pay-per-view or special event you've ever seen? It probably is Heroes of Wrestling. It was really, 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 really bad. Really horribly bad. Spinner Media YT. Every time I see your Twitter handle, I just think like, I, I almost hope it's like a SpinnerNet1 question. Uh, would you ever do wrestling scouting reports to see where people would score in your five-tool player system? Um, yeah, maybe some type of like wrestling scouting reports. Like, maybe. Like, I only have a certain amount of time in the day to and we to do but so many videos between this channel and then the the sports channel. So, you know, I have to strategically pick and choose like what videos I do, but that might be an interesting concept. Uh, at the great old one, <laughs> who do you think should be the one to defeat Roman Reigns for the title? To be determined. I'm not ready to end Reigns' reign right now. Uh, at CA Mitch 100, have there ever been any wrestling matches so horrible you couldn't finish watching it? Several Bucks of Suck matches are the first thing that jumped to mind. They're not the only ones. You know, there have been some great Kali stinkers, like, comes in all different shapes and sizes and forms, but those would be a couple that I could think of offhand. At Luke 34 36430823, change your fucking Twitter handle. As we know, Roman Reigns is the biggest baby face in the business, because he is. Is there anyone in any promotion you feel is best positioned to take his torch and lead us into another boom period should they finally decide to make new stars? No. But he is the biggest baby face in the business right now. At the Akari Warrior, who is the better heel right now? Roman Reigns or the new John Cena? Well, because Roman Reigns is a baby face and John Cena apparently is an imperialistic colonialist, not hard to choose. It's John Cena. That's the fucking heat magnet. That fucking sellout bitch. <laughs> and at D. Jose. My dude, he's watched this channel for a damn decade. David, it's good to see you. He said, this deserves its own video, but what was the worst reign of terror? It almost does, I think. The Memphis mid-card piece of crap from 2002 to 2006? Or God, Duga, from 2002 to 2004? Holy shit, you know what? This actually does deserve its own video in due time. So thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, there's your answer. I'm going to make you wait with suspense. 
But thank you everybody for submitting your questions. Make sure you check out part two coming up soon.